Well, in the days of old, when Gerald R. Ford was president in the land, and there was not really a famine, a man from Lancaster County, together with his bride, came to settle in the abundantly lush country of Pennsylvania. The man's name was Dave, and the name of his bride was Pam. And they went to Mount Joy, and they lived there. Now, the bride had grown up in a foreign land called Ohio, and she had never tasted chicken corn soup or scrapple and not even a rivel. And from a can, she drank pop, because soda was made by mixing seltzer water and fruit syrup and ice cream. She was sometimes forhuddled, many times had she read up and she didn't even know it, and she vowed never to be shusly. Although she grew to dearly love her mother-in-law, Hazel, and her father-in-law, Henry, in those years, many times had Pam longed for her own people and probably would have returned to live in the country of Ohio, the land of the Buckeyes, had it not been for her unfailing love for Dave. Although Ruth's life and mine aren't much alike in many ways, at different times in my life, I have been so inspired by her story. What a beautiful story at many levels. And the thread that runs throughout in the original language, hesed, the Hebrew word meaning literally to deal kindly, often interpreted as steadfast love or loving kindness. This characteristic, usually attributed to God in the scripture, is an active love that expects nothing in return. And although God is mentioned only in passing in this book, God's loving kindness, this hesed, is between the lines throughout all of the story. The characters personify and communicate the loving kindness of God to each other. And the foreigner, Ruth, is the example par excellence of this hesed, as demonstrated by what she does on behalf of her mother-in-law. Ruth, a Moabite, had married an Israelite man. When he died prematurely, Ruth, as a widow, would have traditionally returned to her own people. But Ruth shows uncommon loving kindness, hesed, to her mother-in-law Naomi, and a deep devotion to the God of Israel. And so she followed Naomi back to Bethlehem, where the barley harvest was just beginning, and they joined the Israelite women who were gleaning the fields. And we pick up the story here in Ruth chapters 3 and 4. Naomi, Ruth's mother, mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See? He is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Ruth said to Naomi, all that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighbor, neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Well, depending upon my station in life, this story has spoken to me in different ways as Ruth is revisited. Through the eyes of a young child, I remember this story as one of my favorites in the whole Bible. It is charming, it's almost fairy tale like where everybody ends up a winner. It has all the good stuff. The heroine, a beautiful and lovable woman who had weathered well some heartbreaking times, declaring her loyalty and love, her hesed for her destitute mother-in-law, 
Naomi would have been all alone in the world, if not for Ruth. So Ruth followed Naomi to the ends of the earth, to a strange land where her beauty and loyalty and hesed to her mother-in-law attracted the attention of a handsome and wealthy man who eventually married her. Together they had a son who became the father of Jesse, the father of King David. All the people in the town declared that Ruth was better than seven sons. And what little girl listening to this story wouldn't want to hear that she was better than seven boys? And everyone lived happily ever after. It just doesn't get much better th than this. Modest, meek, courteous, loyal, responsible, strong, gentle, yet decisive, hardworking, beautiful Ruth always seemed to do the right thing at the right time. And it substantiated my childhood perspective and wish that if you did the right things at the right time, life should be pretty much wonderful. Well, several, year, several years later, through the eyes now of a young woman in love, again I revisited this story and found one of the most beautiful romances in the Bible, or anywhere really. Ruth's words struck a chord in my heart. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. These are words as moving as those of Shakespeare. And I claimed them for my own, for my beloved, albeit a little bit out of biblical context, which was really a young widow's pledge to her mother-in-law. But again, this theme of hesed, this steadfast love to the ends of the earth. And finally, I had the opportunity to revisit this story, yet through another lens, that of preacher and as a woman with some years of experience under her belt. Several years ago, I had the honor of attending a one-day seminar on the five festal scrolls given by Robert Neff Seminary, one of my seminary professors. Bob helped us to view the book of Ruth through the eyes of a scholar. As he uncovered for us some of the layers of this writing, we found it to be rich and revealing, and it helped me to understand that there's so much more to this text than first meets the eye. In the passage prior to this morning's scriptures in chapter 3, Ruth was determined to provide for her mother-in-law by gathering grain from the harvest to keep them from starving. Now, gleaning was a common practice. It was part of the Jewish law, actually, that provided food for the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the alien residents. Hebrew law prohibited an owner, an owner from cleaning up his own field of anything that was left behind after reaping. Implied in gleaning was an ethic of gratefulness for the source of the harvest. It was an acknowledgement that the growth of the grain was a gift given above and beyond the farmer's work. It was a gift of God's provision that it must be shared. And the Hebrew law that provided for gleaning acknowledged that out of gratefulness grew social compassion, which was more important than harvesting efficiency. Ruth set out to seek fields whose owners were obeying this law in order to provide for herself and for her mother-in-law. She ended up in the fields of Boaz, who noted Ruth's hesed and hard work for Naomi above and beyond the call for duty. And Boaz responded by taking the gleaning code even a little bit further. He told his workers to leave just a little extra grain for Ruth to gather. When the harvest was over, Naomi decided that she needed to devise a plan to provide for their future. As was custom of that day, she believed that their only chance for long-term survival was to find a husband for Ruth. When she learned of Boaz's kindness and the fact that he was a distant relative, Naomi's hopes were raised. Here was the possibility for a home and security for them both, and if he and Ruth would marry, their future son would qualify as an heir for Naomi, thus redeeming her lot in life. So devise a plan she did. Here in this third chapter, Naomi instructed Ruth to wait until Boaz was a little tipsy from the harvest party. She told Ruth to find him when he had fallen asleep on the threshing floor and to lie at his feet. 
Now, Ruth agreed completely with carrying out this plan to make her overture to Boaz to become her husband. And nothing should be left to chance. Ruth was to be both looking good and smelling good. It is implied in the original language that Ruth prepared for her visit to Boaz on the threshing floor in the same manner that a bride would have prepared for her wedding day. Looking good and smelling good. Well, in the following verses, the narrator does not spell for us, spell out for us exactly what happened between midnight and morning on the threshing floor. The language used throughout chapter three is both ambiguous and it's playfully suggestive, but we miss that in our English translations. It's been suggested that by the oversight in English of the sexual innuendos of this text, the story is robbed of an essential meaning of an element of its meaning. In the original language, the narrator's penchant for puns, as one commentator points out, develops into a mischievous use of words and phrases that have been understood to have either innocent or sexually suggestive meanings. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, to know and to lie down are each used as euphemisms with sexual overtones. Other such words in this passage have a double entendre as well. The clustering together of so many terms that have both innocent denotations and sexually suggestive connotations must be considered a deliberate narrative ploy. And it leaves the reader wondering if Ruth's behavior behavior is that of a bold but innocent foreigner looking for security, or if Ruth's behavior was at the least unconventional perhaps even scandalous, according to the social standards of the day. A few verses later, Boaz's unwillingness to let it become public knowledge adds to the ambiguity. But whatever did happen that night, Boaz blessed Ruth and described her approach to him in terms of hesed, loving kindness. And he vowed to provide for her, both for her and for Naomi's future. Ruth was willing to defy a social norm by approaching Boaz on the threshing floor, perhaps a scandal in the eyes of the world, in order to do hesed, to show loving kindness above and beyond the call for duty. While this story demonstrates the courage that Ruth displayed, it is important to recognize the risks that she took. Scraping up sustenance from the leftovers of those with plenty, wandering as a stranger in in foreign fields, standing as a woman alone when a woman alone was vulnerable to harassment or abuse or even worse. And by risking rejection by Boaz and having her reputation destroyed, we see in Ruth the plight of the refugee, the widow, the migrant worker, and we also see that she, above all others, embodied Hesed that steadfast love and loving kindness that is most often used in describing God. This is more than a happy ending or a romantic tale. Ruth's story enlarges and deepens the story of God's loving kindness, of God's hesed in welcoming the stranger. And we are to embody that hesed as we encounter the other. This is the story of a resident alien, a pagan foreigner really, who becomes both heroine and ancestor of David. Although gleaning is not practiced in the same way today, it is not completely unfamiliar in our rural counties. When our girls were growing up, one of the rites of passage for their 12th birthday was for their 12th birthday, and it was then that they were finally old enough to to join several neighbors and friends a crew of teenagers and a few adults working the tomato harvester on one of our neighboring farms. For several weeks each summer, they stood elbow to elbow along both sides of a moving conveyor belt, which carried the newly picked tomatoes onto the wagon behind the harvester. And the crew picked out and discarded the rotten tomatoes, the green tomatoes, the stones, the sticks, the occasional mouse or snake that's found, found its way somehow onto the conveyor. For hours they rode and sorted and sometimes sang, 
all mud and rotten tomatoes from heads to flip-flops. Although it was very hard work, they had a ball, and the best part was they got a paycheck at the end of the week. This was their real first job. Well, several summers ago, our third daughter, Jenny, who had spent much of her young life keeping up with and trying to surpass her two big sisters, was 10 years old. And when the tomatoes ripened, both of her big sisters were hired to sort tomatoes for pay. Jenny was as big and as determined as both of the older girls, but she was born two years too late to pick tomatoes that year. When she asked our neighboring farmer if she might go along, he offered to let her glean the field of tomatoes. So Jenny walked behind the harvester alone with a big bushel basket under her arm and filled it for a dollar. It was hard, hard work, and she stuck with it, determined to have a paying job just like her sisters. Although she had very little to show for it at the end of a day of backbreaking gleaning, there was something, something that tugged at my mother's heart, knowing that she had worked so hard, much harder than all the older kids riding the harvester. And I wondered how that felt in her spirit. And I imagine that it tugs at God's parent heart when one of God's beloved children has to glean, working oh so hard, taking the risks that Ruth took to get barely enough grain to fill a bowl and satisfy a hungry belly. Not, ne not necessarily because they were born two years too late, but maybe because they were born into places of poverty and oppression and injustice. And I wonder, how does this feel in their spirit? For millennia, the Hebrew people have gathered together each year to celebrate the Feast of Weeks and to hear read aloud each year this story of Ruth and the call to gratitude and generosity and hesed. And it's here for us in our gathered community that we shape and share the vision of a better world, a world beyond gleaning, a world where there is true sharing and more than enough for all, and all people feel valued. And it is here in our gathered community, both in person and in spirit, that we nurture that vision and work together to bring it to reality. Here is where we renew our spirits. Here is where we give and receive that hesed. And here is where we hear God's call and promise. If we are too comfortable, then here we are challenged. Perhaps we don't need to glean to find, a grain for our next find the grain for our next meal, but we should worry that we will lose touch with those who do. We help each other to remember the reality of the Ruths and the Naomi's of our day, the men and the women and the children who must live on our leftovers, what we leave behind in the field. And here is where we remember, here is where we learn, and here is where we must practice generosity and hesed so that we will be better at it out there in the world that God so loves. And we ask, how might we move beyond gleaning to a truly shared harvest? As the prophet Isaiah called, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food. It is a new day. May it be so.